tried to beat him to the punch, so I didn't have to. I'm sorry, that's just what I was told. <laughs> I don't figure it. it's. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not about me tonight. <laughs> I am glad to be here, though. It's good to see you all. Uh, I'm tired of being part of a historical event. I'm ready to get back to normal. Uh, as close to something like normal, anyway. But uh, we started back at Cambridge on the 31st, and uh, we've had about two-thirds of our normal attendance. And, uh, and, and by like here, we've got some folks that aren't worried at all and some folks are just absolutely scared to to do anything and a little bit in between and that's just about normal so we'll get through this uh, I haven't counted how many times the Bible says it but I know a lot of times the Bible says and it came to pass and this thing has come and it will pass and we might be better for it I know one good thing right now there's been more gospel preaching on Facebook than Mark Zuckerberg probably ever imagined and probably probably even likes, but uh, that's a good thing. And, uh, so, but we're glad to be here, and I wish you all would keep my wife Tina in your prayer. She's going to have some pretty extensive dental surgery this Friday, and uh, it won't be pleasant for her for a couple of days, so if you would keep Tina in your prayers, I know she would appreciate it as well as I. My sign topic for the evening is reviving our love for the word. That title carries with it a very ominous implication as the notion of revival or reviving suggests a return to life or consciousness to become active or flourishing again something which needs reviving or resuscitating implies that what once was vibrant and living has died and needs to be brought to life again. Synonymous with the word revive is resurrect. And the implication is that love for God's word was once alive and flourishing and that, that love has died and so needs brought to life again. I do not think love for the word of God is dead, but I do think it is on life support. Judging by what we see in the world, things we read, some of the just outrageous notions that people have. And I do believe that the gravity of this subject warrants prayerful and careful consideration of all the attendant pitfalls eh, associated with failing to love and honor the Word of God as we ought. Why is it the case that the overall respect and love for the Word of God is not what it was or what it should be. And I think that's the right question to ask, or one of the right questions to ask, when we consider that God's Word is the most logical collection of documents the world has ever known. It's the only collection of documents that reveals to us with divine authority the answers to the most fundamental questions that we need to ask. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? And then attendant to that last question is, what must I do to be saved? There was a time, and, and, and I can remember it, when people would instinctively turn to the Bible for the answers of some of the most fundamental questions. 
And the reason people did that is because they received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe, First Thess or First Thessalonians 2.15. I remember as a boy growing up in the 70s that people didn't question whether or not the Bible was the inspired, inerrant, complete Word of God. Atheists and agnostics were from somewhere else. They weren't in Newport, Ohio, or even Marietta for that matter, that, that I knew of. We just took it for granted that everybody believed in God. Everybody believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that the Bible was the Word of God, and it was true and it was reliable. We didn't question it. I guess it's because nobody taught us to question it, uh, from a, a skeptical standpoint anyway. There was a time when people searched the Scriptures daily, and not just in Berea in the first century. But somewhere along the way, society was taught not merely to question God's word uh, in, in a valid uh, study, but they were taught to just outright doubt it without ever having honestly examined it. And so instead of mankind originating from the mighty hand of God, we came from some primordial goo and transformed through apes into human beings. Instead of being here to fear God and keep his commandments, we are here to seek our own pleasure at all costs to anybody else and none to us. And instead of our fate being heaven or hell when we die, we just die like some animal and, and we, we disappear into nothingness. But if I do my job this evening, I want to try to impress upon you two fundamental truths. Number one, the Word of God is worthy of our love. And second, God's Word, our love for God's Word is manifested by our willingness to submit and be obedient. First, I want to impress upon you the fact that God's word is worthy of our love. And I want to lay out three or four reasons here. Number one being that God's word is worthy of our love because of its accuracy. Even in the mundane things of life, which are not necessarily of a spiritual nature. The Bible as we know it is not a scientific textbook, but it is scientifically accurate every time it broaches that subject. For example, in the temple, there was a large bronze laver, or the Bible calls it the bronze sea. And uh, if I understand it, it was, it was a large vessel uh, for ceremonial washing. And in 1 Kings 7.23, it gives the measurements of it. It says it was three cubits from brim to brim. It was five cubits high and 30 cubits in circumference. Now, a cubit is, it's been debated through the years as to just how big a cubit was, but it was not a precise measurement per se, not like um, some of you have worked in industrial settings um, where machinery had to be set sometimes within three or four thousandths of an inch. It doesn't get down that close. But if you've had basic arithmetic in school and if something is, if, if a circle is three feet across, it's going to be roughly 30 feet in diameter. Because when you take the diameter and you multiply it by 3.14, or pi, then you're going to come up with roughly 30 feet. So this thing was, the Bible tells us that it was 
three cubits across and 30 cubits in circumference. That's essentially scientifically accurate. Did you know there's a group today called the Flat Earth Society? Here in 2020, there are people who believe the earth is flat. And yet, in Isaiah 40 and 22, the prophet writes that God sits above the circle of the earth. 750 years before Christ, man knew the earth was round and not flat. Job talked about a vault, as it's called in some translations. And as I understand it, it was the vault that Job refers to was something that was, was round. The Bible is not a medical journal, but it's medically accurate. On December 13th, 1799, George Washington took ill began with a sore throat and his condition rapidly declined. George Washington was a proponent of the ancient practice of bloodletting. It was believed by the ancients and its speculation says that it was originated in Egypt. But a lot of physicians back then believed that a lot of the ills of the body could be healed by getting rid of excess blood. Hopefully the blood that they got rid of would contain whatever was ailing them and then they would be healed. So the day after George Washington really took sick, he requested to be, to be bled some in an effort to heal. And the reports say that they drained anywhere from five to seven pints of blood from George Washington in less than 16 hours. And the day following he died. And the speculation is that excessive blood loss is what cost him his life. If they had read what Leviticus said, or what Moses said in Leviticus 17.11, they might not have practiced such an extreme version of bloodletting because Moses writes that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so it only makes sense that if you get rid of all the blood, then you get rid of the life. The Bible told us that years and years and years ago. And, and more to the uh, recent uh, crisis that we've been in, God gave Moses principles of quarantine in Leviticus 13, verses 1 through 5. This was between the 16th and 13th centuries B.C. And it wasn't until about the 14th century A.D. that man realized that quarantine could stem the tide of infectious disease. Man discovered it in the 14th century A.D. But God had told Moses nearly 30 centuries prior. You have to love a book like that, that knows these things. Not only is God's word worthy of our love because of that kind of accuracy, but also for what it reveals about the past. The Bible is that which it's, well, let me say this. God has revealed himself to us in a couple different ways, general revelation and special Revelation. General revelation is what you and I can discover about God from nature. The creation, that uh, the planets, how they're in their orbit, the earth being tilted on its axis in such a, such a way that it gives us the seasons, the earth being the precise uh, elliptical orbit around the sun so that we have our seasons. We're not too far from the sun that we freeze. We're not too close to the sun that we burn up. Uh, the, it, the mathematical orthodoxy in the universe which allows scientists to predict when the next comet is going to be visible to us, when the next solar or lunar eclipse is going to be, because there is this fundamental orthodoxy, this evidence of design. And that 
points us to a designer, obviously. It points us to a supernatural being that orchestrated these things. The psalmist said in 19.1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So there's no reason for us to not speculate, at least, that there is an, an all-powerful being out there that has set all these things in motion. Paul said it this way in Romans 1, beginning in verse 18. He said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's what unrighteousness does. It suppresses the truth. They don't want you to know about God. They don't want you to know about Christ. They don't want you to know about a moral standard. They don't want you to know about the scientific foreknowledge of the Bible. Wicked people have been suppressing the truth for years. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them, the things they see in nature. Because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been divinely or have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. In other words, you and I can observe the things of nature. And if we contemplate these things, the seasons, the, the food cycle in nature, the, the way the animals interact, we have no excuse for not believing in God. I sat on my deck the other morning while I was reading and contemplating, and I noticed a mother robin and a baby robin. And the baby robin was, was down in a ditch in some tall grass. And the mother robin had a worm in its mouth, and it was trying to coax this baby robin out of the ditch. The mother would get close to the baby robin with that worm and almost put it in its mouth. And the robin would reach for it, and the mother would back up. And she did that four or five times until that baby robin was out of the tall grass in the ditch. It's, it was amazing. And some genius that's educated beyond his intelligence is going to tell me that that was all just a big accident that happened billions and billions of years ago. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. When an atheist says, I do not believe in God, what he is actually saying is, I don't want to believe in God. Atheistic biologist Richard Lewontin admitted, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. He doesn't want to entertain any notion of God. Aldous Huxley said, that he objected to biblical morality because it interfered with his sexual freedom. It's not that he didn't believe so much, he just didn't want it. It was inconvenient. Thomas Nagel wrote, quote, I want atheism to be true. I am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most, listen to this, this is an atheist saying this, I am uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God. I don't want there to be a God. Remember what Paul said back in verse 22 of Romans 1? <laughs> Claiming to be wise, they become fools. The psalmist wrote in 14.1, The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. Everything and everybody got here somehow. The Christian believes that God did it. For every house is built by some man, but he that buildeth all things is God. The house didn't just show up. I didn't just appear one day. 
My presence here was contingent upon my parents. Their, their presence here was contingent upon their parents. And so on and so forth, clear back to Adam and Eve, whose existence was contingent upon the mighty hand of God. And when we get to God, behold, we have the first non-contingent being. God's existence did not rely on anybody or anything else because he is God. You and I are contingent beings. The theist believes that his deity, whomever it might be, set everything in place. And to the atheist, time is the hero of the story. Given enough time, nothing can bump into nothing, and behold, we have something. That doesn't even make good nonsense. General revelation, however, does not tell us some of the most fundamental things that we need to know. General, revel general revelation does not tell you and me how to worship God acceptably. It does not tell us how we are to conduct ourselves and interact with other folks. General revelation does not tell us what to do to be saved, thus the need for special revelation, which is the Word of God. God's Word given to us in written form, the Bible. Now, the Bible doesn't answer every question you and I have. But every question that it answers, it answers accurately and with divine authority. And it is necessary. It's frustrating to me when I hear people lament about studying the Old Testament. We don't live under that law anymore. How come we have to study the Old Testament? I'm here to tell you the Bible would be incomplete without the Old Testament. Think about when the Old Testament was written. If I understand it, it was written by Moses, probably from Mount Sinai, when the, after the children of Israel had escaped from Egypt. Okay. Now think about this. The Israelites had been in Egyptian bondage for 430 years. The generation that went into bondage had died, were buried, generation after generation after generation lived in bondage. They lived as slaves. They lived as abused people. And finally, God brings them out. All these people had known was slavery. They had lost their identity as not only a nation, but as individuals. God needed to restore in their minds their identity their purpose for living. They were unprepared to be free. And they needed to be taught their heritage. Thus, God instructed Moses to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in those five books, some particularly important facts are revealed. We learn where we came from. God, the creator, Genesis 1 and 2. We learn that God judges sin, Genesis 3. We learn also in Genesis 3 that God was going to offer pardon. God was going to make a way for man to be saved. In the very first messianic prophecy in Scripture, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we learn from the Old Testament in over 350 messianic prophecies that a Savior was going to come into the world. A lot of the New Testament would not make sense to us were it not for what we have in the Old Testament. I remember uh, Charles Pugh telling us uh, preacher boys when we were in preaching school that the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed and the, New Test and the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. I think I got that right. But they, they complement one another. We move to the New Testament and we read in the Gospels the, the commencement of the fulfillment of those prophecies that the Old Testament made. How many times do we read in the Gospel accounts, this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying. And it kind of like Paul Harvey, you remember? It, it gives us the rest of the story. In the New Testament, Christ is revealed as our eternal creator. 
In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And by Him were all things made, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. John 1, 1 through 3 and verse 14. I remember the day that it dawned on me that, that Jesus was with God in during creation. I guess I missed the, that Sunday where they explained that to me, but I just always assumed Jesus, Jesus came on the scene in a manger in Bethlehem. And I was reading in Genesis 126, let us create ma uh, man in our image. Plural pronouns. Wait a minute, who's with him? And when you look at John 1, 1 through 3, you see that Christ was with him. He was there all along. Christ is revealed as the Savior of the world. Mary was told she would bring forth a son. She was to call his name Jesus, for he would save the people from their sins, Matthew 1, 21. We find that Christ saved us by the process of redemption, Galatians 3, 13. In Hebrews 4, 15, we read that Christ is our high priest. What does that mean to us? If we didn't know anything about the Old Testament and, and the function of the priesthood then, we wouldn't have a proper appreciation of the high priesthood of Jesus Christ and the priesthood of which you and I are members now if we are indeed baptized believers. We don't have to go through a priest. We are priests. That's why we can pray to God and pray intercessory prayers. Christ is our mediator. That's why we don't have to pray through Mary or some other so-called saint. The only mediator between us and God is the man, Christ Jesus. After the Gospels, we come to the book of Acts, and we see the birth of the Church of Christ in Acts chapter 2. And then in subsequent chapters, we read about the growth of the church, we read about the spread of the Gospel, and we learn what to do to be saved. And each one of those accounts are a little bit different, and they give us different angles, I guess, of salvation. We, we get to see them from different perspectives. The same way we have four perspectives of the life of Christ. People say, well, they're different. They contradict. A difference is not a contradiction, necessarily. If we take four people and we put one of you on this side of the building, one in the front, one on this side, one in the back, and say, now draw a picture, or take a picture, you got your little phone with you, take a picture of the building. They're going to have four pictures of the same building, but each one of them is going to be different. That's what we have in the Gospels. And that way we get this whole panorama of the life and the ministry of Christ, of the things that we need to know. We turn to the epistles, and we learn how to deal with problems within the church, did you know there are problems in the church sometimes? We learn how to deal with them in the epistles and in Acts. We learn how to provide encouragement for our brethren. We learn how to provide encouragement for ourselves. We receive, we receive instruction and proper conduct for Christians today. Yes, God's word is worthy of our love because of what it reveals about the past. But also, God's word is worthy of our love because of what it reveals about the present. Each one of us has a past, a present, and hopefully a future. And one day we must give an account for this life. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. 
You see, it was revealed to us in the past that what we do in the present is going to be judged in the future. We have to live with that. We love God's word because it reveals our responsibility. Now, that's a bad word for some people. We don't like the word responsibility. But it reveals our responsibilities for the present, and it gives us a glimpse into what awaits contingent upon our behavior now. The Bible tells us how to properly worship God. John 4.24 says we have to worship God in spirit and in truth. The right object. The right attitude. And the right method. Not everything that people do and say, well, I'm doing this in the name of God, or I'm doing this for the benefit of, not everything is acceptable to God. People say, well, that's kind of narrow-minded. Well, when we get down to it, the Bible is kind of a narrow-minded book. In John 14, 6, Jesus didn't say, I'm one of the ways, or I'm a way. He said, I am the way. Isn't it nice to know that even though there is one way, we can know what that way is. We don't have to, there's no conjecture involved. Jesus is the way. End of story. If the Bible didn't tell us how to properly worship God, how else would we know? Judging by some of the practices that we see today and things that are called Christian worship, one might think there was no God-inspired pattern for worship. We see the advent of praise teams and drama skits to act out the gospel. <laughs> Jesus said go into the world and preach the gospel, not act it out. We've gotten to the point where we want a religion of convenience rather than a religion of conviction. And it's because some have strayed from the pattern. The Bible tells us how to treat those people around us. Jesus said, so whatever you wish that others do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets, Matthew 7, 12. The golden rule. Boy, that's really taken a hit lately, hasn't it? It's one of the most loved and yet one of the most, one of the least practiced verses in Scripture. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the impact that the golden rule would make in the world if people only lived by that much of the Bible? I, I wish everybody that knew. Judge not, knew the golden rule, and lived by it. We could get rid of lawyers. <laughs> Sorry if you're a lawyer. I don't mean. We could get rid of a lot of unnecessary pain and suffering if people would just live by the golden rule. We learn about forgiveness. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Because of God's word, we know about grace. Grace, that's God's reaching out to us, extending himself to us because he loves us. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's just automatically saved by grace. We have to access that grace. Uh, you know, people say, well, we're all God's children. No, we're not. We all have the right to become God's children, John 1, 12. We learn about mercy from the Bible. We learn that God is rich in mercy, Ephesians 2, 8. We learn about peace 
in the Bible. That beautiful word peace, the Greek word irene, from where we get the, the beautiful name Irene. And peace is not what a lot of people think it is. Oh, peace is a, a feeling. I feel at peace. Peace is not so much a feeling as it is a state of being in harmony with God's will. People can feel at peace even though they're living in violation of God's will. They live in sin, a sinful practice, and they say, but I've made my peace with God. No, that's backwards. We have to make God's peace with us. It's not about a feeling. We learn about true love from God. Agape love, the noun, agapao, the verb. For God so loved the world that he told us? No, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, love is not merely emotion either. That agape love is active goodwill with the other person's benefit in view. It's putting self on the back burner and thinking of somebody else for a change. We learn about salvation. All the information that you and I possess about salvation has come from God's word, not from nature, not from philosophical musings of man. It comes from God's word. And it's a, the religion of Christ is a taught religion. In John 6, the Bible, uh, Jesus said, No one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Cornelius was told to send for, excuse me, Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thee and thine house shall be saved. Philip preached unto the Ethiopian eunuch. Paul and Silas spoke the word of Christ to the Ethiopian or to the Philippian jailer. We have to be taught God's plan of salvation. Not, some of you old enough to remember back in the 70s, Tom T. Hall had a very popular song called Me and Jesus Got Our Own Thing Going. Me and Jesus Got It All Worked Out. It was a great song for Tom T. Hall, but that is horrible theology. We don't get to pick and choose our own way because Jesus Christ is the way. And we only know that from the Bible. If you can't love a book like that, then God help you. God's word is worthy of our love because of what it reveals about the future. What lies in your future? Ten minutes from now, an hour from now, tomorrow, next week, next year, ten years. How long are you going to live? Another country singer from slightly before Tom T. Hall, Hank Williams Sr., had a song called, I'll, We'll Never Get Out of This World Alive. And how true that is. Each one of us is going to be somewhere for eternity. We won't be here on earth, contrary to the watchtower witness dogma. The earth is going to burn up, 2 Peter 3.10. But Jesus said, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming into which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of uh, life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And after the Lord separates the, the sheep from the goats, Matthew 25, we find that the goats, the lost, shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the sheep, the righteous, into life eternal. Two different English words, eternal and everlasting, but they're the exact same word in the Greek. The duration of heaven and the duration of hell are the same, eternity. And our love for God's word is manifested by our obedience. You look at everything that's been lost in the Bible from disobedience.
paradise was lost in Genesis 3. Canaan was lost for Moses in Numbers 20. Nadab and Abihu lost their lives in Leviticus 10. But our Bible heroes that we read about in Hebrews 11, their success was exhibited by their obedience, their adherence to the word of God. The psalmist said in the very first psalm, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth at the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now you may find some things in the word of God that you particularly don't love right off the bat. There might be some things in the Bible that you have to learn to love. But love them you must. And learn to live by them. God's word, the Bible, is certainly worthy of our love. Listen to the words of Peter in 2 Peter 1.3. As God's divine power hath granted to us all things, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Everything that we need for life and godliness can be found on the pages of this volume of 66 books contained in, in one book, We show our love for God and his word when we faithfully obey it. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. The poet has written, My dear Bible, exponent of light, Thou sword of the spirit put error to flight, And still through life's journeys until my last sigh, We'll travel together, my Bible and I. Read it. Study it. Love it. It'll get you where you want to go. What if you're not a Christian tonight? Someday the Lord is going to part the skies and he's going to come in glory with the shout of the archangel. And if you're a Christian, you'll look up and see the Lord and you'll go, yes! But what if you're not a faithful Christian and you see the Lord? It'll be, oh no. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. And if you're willing to repent of your sin, Luke 13, 3. And if you'll confess the name of the Lord Jesus, Matthew 10, 32, it would be our pleasure to assist you in your obedience to the gospel. And final obedience, being baptized for salvation, Mark 16, 16. If you are a child of God and you've been unfaithful, we'd encourage you to come forward. We will pray with you and pray for you. We'll study whatever your need might be. But don't leave here tonight if you're not prepared. Let's go to heaven, and let's take as many with us as we can. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please come now as we stand and sing.